<laughs> Get naked. <laughs> We're having a whole sermon on intimacy. Of course we can say that. <laughs> my name is Chad Merle, and this is my wife, Jana, and we've been married for 11 years. We constantly communicate. Uh, we're always talking, working through things. I think the other thing that brings success in our relationship is sarcasm and humor. <laughs> uh, we don't take anything too seriously. Uh, so we, our house is filled with a lot of laughter and, and joking and yeah, fun. For sure. I think also a lot of gentleness and kindness go a long way in a marriage. And people can forget to be gentle and kind with their spouse. And Mm-hmm. I think that's very important. When we don't communicate, mm-hmm. uh, when there's a breakdown in the communication or a lack of communication, it always causes problems for us. I didn't tell her something, uh, or she didn't tell me, or we, uh, we let something fester for too long. Mm-hmm. Uh, something was bothering us, and rather than talking to one another mm-hmm. about it, we didn't take care of it, and it became something bigger than it ever should have been because we didn't communicate. Yeah, for sure, and I'm an over-communicator, so I really need to know everything the second he knows it. So when he waits a couple weeks to tell me something the night before, (laughs) it doesn't always go over so well. (laughs) I think for us, we handle the conflict by communication. but the key in that for us is uh, we never let our emotions take over the conversation. We've never yelled at each other. We've never let it get out of hand. And if we feel like it's escalating and it's starting to get out of hand, uh, we take a break and we walk away and come back when we've calmed down. Uh, we do a pretty good job of just resetting. You know, We'll have the conflict and we'll communicate and we'll get the conflict resolved. And then when we're done, We just kind of step right back into where we left off and we don't let it affect the future anymore. We we forgive and we move on, so. Yeah, I think we do a good job of dealing with the situation at hand and not bringing Mm -hmm. up past things or anything like that. We try to really communicate about our emotions and how we're feeling in the moment and then we're done with it Mm -hmm. and we move on. Not to give up. You know, always have hope in God and His promises because He will always come through. The moment you give up and you give up on your marriage, that's when you can't turn back. Even in the midst of conflict, we've always known that if we just stay true to God and we follow His Word and do what it says as far as being a husband and being a wife, that God's going to redeem that situation and not let us down. He's going to stay true to His promises. Yeah, I think I would want people to know that you need to be your spouse's safe place. They need to feel comfortable telling you things without you reacting in a way that will cause them to not feel validated or cause them to feel hurt by your reaction. So that if something does come up, they don't have to worry about how you're going to react to it and that they will feel safe telling you things so that you can have open communication. Yeah, we've had some of the best moments in our marriage has been when We've had to confess to one another um, and had to be transparent and had to have a difficult conversation, Mm -hmm. uh, but we've grown so much in those moments uh, and it's strengthened our marriage uh, rather than hurting it. Well, good morning, Calvary. How many of you are just having a great day today? It is so awesome to be around folks that are having a great day. It's kind of fun being around folks that are not having a great day if you're having a great day because you're like really bubbling and they're going, what? We are continuing our marriage enrichment series for better or for worse. Many of you stood before the Lord and witnesses on the day that you chose to marry your spouse, and you made a commitment to stay in a marriage relationship. You said, I'm going to stay in this marriage relationship. You even announced probably, for better or for worse. Some of you right now are going, Lord, 
I just didn't know it was going to be this way in our relationship. So, Lord, here's what I want you to do. Lord, I want you to fix that spouse that I'm married to (laughs) so that I can enjoy all of that better or that good that you promised. Lord, would that be all right with you? And then some of you also stood before the Lord and you made a commitment to stay in your marriage relationship for richer or for poorer. I was one of those fellas who stood on a platform very similar to this 24 years ago and looked Miss Claudia deep in her beautiful eyes when she said these words to me, I will love, honor, and cherish you for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, till death do us part or separates us. And she has reminded me on several occasions that she married me for my money, and she's staying married to me till I get it. (laughs) You see, that's what I call family security right there, boys and girls. I want to share a few minutes uh, and a few passages with you from God's Word that has helped Claudia and I in our marriage relationship to, to be what I classify as a successful marriage relationship. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Proverbs, the third chapter of Proverbs, verses 5 and 6. And most of you are going, Chet, I know this passage. If you don't have a Bible, there are a few Bibles that are in front of you. It's on page 671. You can turn to that. And by the way, if you don't have a Bible that you use on a regular basis, that's why we have them in the pew, so that you can use them here. And if you'll read it, carry it with you and enjoy reading it all during the week. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says this. It says, trust in the Lord with all of your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Did did you notice the words that it started off with? Trust in the Lord. God tells us in his word, first and foremost, before we proceed to do much of anything else, to trust in him with what? With all of our heart. How much of your heart? All All of your heart. Say all. 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 See, if we're going to choose to trust God with all of our heart, it looks similar to this to me. Lord, I surrender to you. You are my Lord and my Savior. I invite you to come into my life and change my life, Lord. I give you my life. You know, that's more than just saying, you know, I kind of like this religious thing. That is accepting with all of your heart, trusting God and saying to him, Lord, I'm going to trust you. But do you notice right behind what it says there? It says, do not lean on your heart own understanding. In other words, don't just trust what you know, your vision, or your limited knowledge or understanding for your life to be complete on a day-to-day basis, on a moment-by-moment basis. Trust in the Lord with everything that you have. Acknowledge him, and he'll make your path straight. Now, what's the shortest distance between two lines? A straight line, isn't it? Now, as he said, I'll make your path straight. There may be side roads that are there, and God's trying to work it out. So it'll be a straight path to your development and your relationship of becoming, on a day-to-day basis, more Christ-like. Now, he didn't say, I'm going to take away all of those obstacles. He said, I will make your path straight. And I believe in our marriage relationships or your personal relationship with those that are here. If you happen not to be married, you have a Savior who loves you, who will embrace you, and I'm going to encourage you to take seriously that commitment. That means that you're going to trust God with your commitment to your marriage and your marriage relationship. That means also, I believe, that you're going to trust God with the development of the intimacy in your relationship. We heard the pastor O.C., who, by the way, is our family pastor and doing a great job as leading our family ministry, say a key word that I believe is essential in a marriage relationship or in any relationship. He continued, and Jana continued to use the word communicate. 
Communicate, communicate, communicate. Real estate is location, location, location. Relationship is communication, communication, communication. Trust me, it's worked well for me in my life and Claudia's life. So you're going to choose to communicate clearly your needs and your wants. We're also going to make a choice to trust God with the direction of our parenting skills. Have you noticed that pretty much everybody has a way of doing it and their way seems always to be the best way, right? What's the best way? The way that actually works, isn't it? <laughs> and I, can, I, can I point you to something that works every time? Right here. God's Word works every time. And so if we'll choose to trust God's Word in applying biblical principles to how we raise our children and invest in our children, it will be, be a lot better. And today I'm going to talk about something that most of you don't want to hear about. Matter of fact, statistics say that there are several reasons why most folks don't come to church. First of all, that it's filled with a bunch of hypocrites that say one thing and do something different outside the door. Therefore, I don't want to walk into that place. Calvary, I don't believe, is one of those places. We have diligently worked on being very transparent with one another. Almost painfully transparent in some situations, right? The other thing is, every time I show up, Chet, you're talking about money. Well, guess what? Every time you show up, I'm not talking about money. But I am going to talk about money today. Actually, what I'm going to talk about is a financial plan. That's not so much just money. That's a financial plan for you. And then we look and we trust God with our marriage relationship, with our finances. That will give us a little bit of peace as we journey forward. In other words, in simple terms, it's not in us we trust. It's not in that dollar bill we trust. It's in God that we trust. In God we're going to trust. It goes back to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the what? Lord. In God we trust. So will you make a commitment? Will you take a step to trust God today? Not only declaring it with your words as we just did and have for the last four weeks, but will you actually back those words up with actions and choose to apply some of the principles that I believe can help make your relationships stronger and more successful? In those, I have four steps or action points that I want to share to help you identify ways to help you improve a financial plan. Now, some of you are looking at me going, Chet, I don't have a whole lot. What do I need a financial plan? If you have finances, you need a financial plan. So the first part of my financial plan or my advice to you is to formulate a budget. That's the first step, formulating a budget. How many of you find yourself using the phrase, boy, I should have, oh, I wish I had, oh, if we only could have. I had a manager one time that reminded me on a consistent basis, if you don't have a plan check, you have a plan to fail. And it's absolutely 100% the truth, or it has been the truth in Chet's life, as I've applied these principles. So as we look at formulating a budget, step one in formulating that budget is this. Decide how the money you have is going to be spent. Whose money is it really? Do you really believe that it's God's money? In all reality, it's not just his resources and his money, is it? It's everything including all of our being. And a matter of fact, that last breath that you just took doesn't really belong to you. It's in your lungs, but it belongs to God. If we truly believe that we totally exist at God's will in our lives, it's all God's. And he's simply given us some direction to say, hey, might want to formulate a plan of the way that you want to spend the resources, especially my resources. And here's the real hard part for most of us. And the reason why I say it is because 95% of you haven't taken this next step I'm going to talk about. The hard part is write it down. You can formulate a budget all day long. And that budget may exist in your head. It may exist in some mythical place that you keep referring to. But until you take the time to write it down or put it in your iPad or put it on your some type of formulation to where you actually see it, writing it down, I believe that you're going to fail if you choose not to write it down. 
Matter of fact, that's not just me making that up. Statistics show that in a group study, only 5% of the people interviewed, 5% of the people that were interviewed actually had formulated a plan and written it down. Here's what they did in that interview. It was a control group, and they tracked finances for those folks. The 5% outperformed the 95%. And you look at me and say, Chet, you're just making that up. No, I'm finding out that it's true. In most situations, the 95% combined were more successful in managing their finances. That 5% outperformed the 95%. I can tell you for a fact, I personally have found this to be true, and Claudia is in our case. We've chosen to honor God and formulate a budget. We've chosen to write it down. But here's a key component in writing it down for it to be successful. You really, truthfully need to prioritize your spending. Prioritize your spending. Now, This is the point where most of the disagreements in relationships are going to occur when it comes to finances. By the way, finances are the second reason, the second reason most folks get divorced. Discussing and arguing over monies. Physical relationship is the first. So if this is the second, don't you think it's important that we know that, that we talk about that, that we formulate something to prevent Satan from getting in and dividing us? Prioritize our spending. To be successful at this point, I believe it is imperative to communicate, we're back to that word communication again, openly and honestly the difference in wants and needs in our relationship. You may want something, your spouse may want something that's totally different, but if you don't communicate that, you're expecting your spouse to be a mind reader. Now, the last time I checked, when I looked at Claudia, I am not a magician or a mind reader. I cannot read her mind. Now, most of the time I can tell you what she's thinking, but I can't read her mind if she comes up with a plan. So openly communicate that. Clarify the goal of what you want to accomplish by identifying what's important to us in our relationship where our spending is, con- is concerned. Prioritize that spending. This step is not a one and done, by the way. Here's what I'm going to encourage you to do. As you prioritize in your budget, revisit that on a quarterly, semi-annual, or an annual basis. Why would that be important? What worked yesterday may not work tomorrow. I can guarantee you I paid a whole lot less for fuel 11 years ago than I do today. That altered my budget from 11 years ago to today. That's just one of those things that we look at. So on a Weekly, monthly, quarterly, semi-annual, or annual basis, look at your budget. Adjust. Make adjustments to your budget and prioritize how your spending is going to help you be successful in managing the finances God's entrusted to you. Did you notice I said that he's entrusted to you? Because ultimately, whose finances and resources are they? They're God's. They truly are God's. Now, the first suggestion, if I could make a few suggestions to you, is this. Sign up and attend Financial Peace University classes, FPU classes. If you'll look in your bulletin, if you'll take and you'll open and you'll look in the bulletin, we have a class that's coming up. And there's limited space in that. So we're going to schedule various classes through the year. Various opportunities for you to learn. You look, well, Chad, I'm doing really good with my finances. Phenomenal. Choose to invest $100 in yourself and your spouse so that you can share what you can learn with others that you have influence with if you're not doing so and have a biblical foundation to growing to financial freedom. Now, I don't know about you guys. I love freedom. But freedom comes with a price most of the times. There's a responsibility. And if you also look in that same announcement for Financial Peace University, you're going to find some results. That's just from the last class that went through. A few results that happen, that are going on, that we can brag about, that we can say, look what God's doing 
and ladies and gentlemen's lives that are choosing to commit their finances to a biblical plan. Also, we'd like for you to understand that there's other areas that most of you really and truly, I'm not sure you understand, or if you do, do not want to talk about. It's one that's found in the Old Testament. Most of you know where I'm headed with this. The book of Malachi, chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, addresses this. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. The word tithe means actually, literally, 10%. And God does not offer that as a suggestion, by the way. Remember, it all belongs to him. He allows us to use 100% of it, and he simply says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to bring into the storehouse 10%. Now, if you do a little background looking in the book of Malachi, there were some issues that were going on in resourcing and funding ministry and missions in that area, and Nehemiah was reminding the folks that they had been robbing God. They would not been bringing what God had commanded for them to do. That's not optional, by the way. But the cool part of it not being optional, since all 100% belongs to God anyway, he says, do this. If you do this, if you try this, I, if you will prove me on this, see if I will not open. Open for you a blessing that I will bestow on you a blessing. Isn't it amazing that it comes with a blessing, a gift? Now, it may not be instantaneous. For me in my situation, I can remember driving a 1980 Chevrolet Monza for about 10 years. Oh, yeah, woo! For about 10 years that it should have been in the junkyard. And by the way, never one time put me down on the road as I was running a route for almost 10 years in that little car. That's a miracle from God. That's an example of how I believe God will pour out his blessing even on a Chevrolet Monza. (laughs) The other area that I want us to talk about as we look and develop the process of being generous is prioritize once we've realized that it belongs to God is prioritize some things in our lives food. Is that a priority for you? It definitely is for me. I just found out who's, who's listening, right? How about clothing? Is clothing a priority? I'm not talking about name brands. I'm talking about clothing. Here's the example that I used in the last service. I'm pretty sure most of you wouldn't want to see me standing up here without clothes on, right? <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I would want to see me standing up here. That's a necessity in our lives. Food, clothing. What about a roof over our head or shelter, a place to lay our head and rest? Those are priorities. So make a list, outline, prioritize the dollars that you're going to invest in those areas with the 90% that God trusts you with. And then here's an area that I'm really going to get some ooze on, but I am personally passionate about this. Purchase medical and life insurance, not necessarily in that order, by the way. Medical and life insurance. Why is that important, Chet? Why is that important to you, you say? Well, let me ask you a question. If I told you for every dime you gave me, I would give you 90 cents. No strings attached. How many dimes do you suppose you could find? I would want to find a truckload of dimes. I don't know about you. Well, that's what God's trying to tell us to do here in protecting and providing for your family. Now, how many of you own vehicles and have them insured? Nice. Pretty much every one of you. How many of you own a home and have it insured? Wow. We will take the time to insure an object that actually, most of the time, depreciates. In some areas, does appreciate and increases. We'll take the time and invest and insure those. But I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on the next one. But this is the question I want you to ask yourself. Why is it that I put more importance on my vehicle and my house than I do my life or my health? 
Invest, make it a priority to invest in health and life insurance for your family's sake. You see, I've outlined several suggestions that will help you build a stronger marriage relationship through formulating a budget, through writing it down, through prioritizing your spending. I've even made some suggestions that have worked well for the Anderson household, and I, I hope that they'll work well for you if you apply them. But I believe that there's a key to this success. I believe that there's a key to making this financial plan is that you live within your means. Live within your means. And say live within your neighbor's means, your means. God doesn't necessarily need to give us more dollars. Sometimes he needs to adjust our wants and be able to invest and live within our means. You see, don't fall into one of the most vicious traps that's out there called credit or debt. Because in all reality, credit cards are wonderful if you use them and understand that's your money, but most of us don't use them like they're our money, so don't use them. That's somebody else's money, not yours. And generally, you get to pay it back with a pretty enormous fee that's attached to it if you really figured it out. And credit or credit card debt is one of those areas, traps, I call it, that will help you fall into a nasty, nasty, nasty trap that will absolutely aid in helping ruin your communication about finances in your relationship. If you don't believe it, ask someone who is fighting through financial debt because of the ease of credit. Don't fall into that trap. So we talked about having a financial plan, and we talked about formulating a budget and writing it down and then prioritizing it. But here's the real key. If you don't take this next step, everything else is basically going to be useless. Follow your plan. Follow the plan that God has given you. You can take all of those other suggestions, but if you choose not to follow your plan, you are absolutely planning to fail. Calvary and your pastors and your staff and your family members that are in this room want every one of us to succeed and to grow in our marriage relationship, in our personal relationship, in our relationship with God. And so we're asking you to invest in yourself. We're asking you to apply a few of these principles that may help make a difference in your marriage relationship as to how you handle your finances. Claudia made a comment to me when we were talking about this sermon. and She said, you know, I, I really believe that most folks don't need more money. They just need a little more faith in God. And I truly believe that that is an accurate biblical statement because it goes back to trusting in God. You know, that's a brilliant woman I'm married to. Trust in God with all, all of your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding, but in every way, in all your ways, Acknowledge God, and he will make your path straight. Will you join me in prayer? Father, it's been amazing that we can sit and we can talk and we can share as brothers and sisters in Christ. And Father, you can challenge us as to how we handle the resources that you give us, whether it's our time, whether it's our vehicles, whether it's our life. So, Father, right now there's lots of processing that's going on. And these words are useless unless you apply them to our heart and our mind and give us the boldness to put your plan in action. Father, we've outlined a plan from your word, so help us to be faithful in living within our means and trusting you and honoring our marriage by trusting you with all of our decisions. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.